Hi, welcome to Make or Repair. I previously did a video on these actuators. They go on motorized valves for central heating. So one central heating, the other hot water. And they'd come up with fault F06, which basically means short circuit. To be clear, I have actually previously shot this video showing how I did a kind of workaround in these devices to get it up and running in a hurry while I waited for the right parts to arrive. But clearly that video was a little bit confusing. The comments indicated I hadn't clarified the type of motor and the current and all that sort of stuff very well. And also there was a huge chunk missing. So the little workaround I put in here actually on the video wouldn't work. There's another little piece that has to be put on top of it to make it work. So I'm going to try and cut that back together and I'll focus less on the workaround, more on the proper fix. And I'll also show some experiments showing how the central heating controller can see the short circuit, open circuits, can tell whether it's reached the end and all that sort of stuff. And even if you saw the previous video, why don't you watch this one, see if it's got something new in it. New actuators are silly money, take a while to deliver, so it's time to take it apart. Okay, the actuator just pulls off and the modular cable unplugs. It's really simple, it's a modular system. Now, I've taken off the central heating valve as well, just in case I need to compare the two. Now it's on the bench, you can see it's part number ML7300A1004. It's got this open, so it's a torque size 10, just to hold the top here. And this is. This has got a key in it, so it only goes on one way. This should hopefully part company. Yeah, and there we have it. There's not a lot in here. So, uh, so here's a motor. It drives this reduction gear, goes onto another gear just here, and onto another one. That's another reduction. And then onto this worm gear. And this, of course, means that turns around and progresses this slowly backwards and forwards with a fair bit of torque. If this reaches the end of its travel and can't go any more, then this worm continues to turn and pushes in at this end. Underneath there, there's a micro switch. You can just see the two leaves of the metal just there. So there we go, the motor's running. You can see the worm turning. So that's eight volts. It seems to be running absolutely fine. And we shall reverse the connections. And it runs that way too. So I think all that's happening is just going over current every time it tries to turn. So we've got a 430 microfarad 10 volt capacitor here. 470 microfarads, 10 volts, and it is not polarized. Yeah, the chances of me having a 470 microfarad non-polarized capacitor are pretty slim. Let's see how it reads. So this is a 470 microfarad capacitor, and we're reading roughly 600 and 90, 687, something like that. Well, you know, it's a bit high. That's usually a giveaway that there's loads of parallel resistance in there, i.e. DC current will flow straight through it. Okay, so I've got my meter here. I've got it set into uh, milliamp range. And we can see we're really, really low numbers, 0.02 something. Let me turn this into microamps. You might not have microamps on your meter. If you saw my video on choosing a low cost meter, then you'll have seen that I was saying you should really be looking, if you're into electronics, you should be looking for that low end. It's not, you don't need 10 amps very often, but you do need microamps occasionally. So let's turn this to microamps. And we're below four microamps. In fact, it's dropping off a little bit now because it's just finishing up its charge. Probably 40 microamps would be okay, but, uh, but 47 microamps maybe. There'll be some multiplier on a typical data sheet that will tell you what's okay and what isn't. You don't need the data sheet for yours, just one for anything similar. Let's, however, connect up this. I'm just going to discharge it first. I'm going to turn it to milliamps, so we're in the same site position before, and I'll just gnaw that little error out. And here we go. So 1.4 milliamp, way out of way out of order from a 470 microfarad capacitor that's suppressing a motor, you shouldn't see that sort of current. I mean, I've been exercising this a lot. I suspect when it comes on in the morning from cold, it could be a lot, lot worse. So that is the source of the fault. And I've got some new ones. These are 470 microfarad, 16 volts. So you can always put a higher voltage in. You don't want to go ridiculously high though, because, you know, this is 16 volts versus eight volts, that's absolutely fine. The motor in here is an eight volt DC motor. So here's our new capacitor, let's get that fitted and then we should be up and running absolutely fine. 
So I'm giving that a little bit of a wrap round, not tightly, it's enough so it'll be kind of immune to vibration later on. Because of course, you know, this has got a motor in it, it will vibrate. And any poor soldering around uh, components like this are going to result in parts falling off. So the position of the capacitor has to be such that, of course, there's room in the case. And it mustn't touch any moving parts, but I think we're there. Beautiful. And although this is the faulty one, I am going to actually do the other one as well, because if one has failed, the other one really isn't going to be that far behind, is it? So in terms of fitting and removing, there's this big circular spring in here. Let me put the back plate on. You can see it just sort of practically shows on these two circles. These fit on two pins on the actual valve itself. So it literally pulls off and pops straight back on again without any screws or anything. So I'm just going to finish reassembling these and I'll get them fitted back on the central heating system. And then I'll come back and do a few experiments with a motor and some capacitors. What I've got here is a motor, which is very similar to the one in the uh, motorized valves. And it's connected through to this little power supply circuit. And basically you push that button, it turns on for a few seconds and then it turns off and it outputs about eight volts. The reason I'm using this instead of a bench power supply is because I want it to simulate the controller. So the controller is gonna have just a simple transistor that switches power on. It'll be an H bridge configuration, but it will either switch the power on in one direction to the motor or the other direction to the motor. And it'll just have some simple transistors or MOSFETs. On the output from this, I've actually got a one ohm resistor to act as a current sense. So my scope is joined up. Channel one is, is monitoring the voltage output and channel two is monitoring the amount of current that we're delivering to the motor. So let's run it first of all with just the motor. So ready to single shot and we shall run. Okay, and here's our signal. So I've got this set to 20 milliamps per division for the blue line or cyan line and the yellow line is the voltage. So we can see it rises quite quickly and then uh, we just get this kind of nice flattish with just a teensy bit of noise on it which is a reflection of this noise down here and this noise apparently is 274 hertz but depending upon my reading it can read 100 kilohertz or, or all sorts of stuff so it's rf interference mainly but also that noise going into your controller is going to make it very difficult for the microcontroller in it to understand what's going on if it samples for example on one of these peaks it might think that your motor's reached the end when it hasn't done so we do need to suppress this noise to some degree and that's the job of the capacitor. So we do expect to see this peak at the beginning. What I'll do is I'll measure that. So if I turn this to 50 milliamps, and we'll just run that again. So there, our peak is 252 milliamps. And then we're about 45 milliamps for the noise, maybe a bit more. And there's a few little peaks in there that you can see as well, which are running a bit higher. But certainly our, our noise and our average current is probably about 50 milliamps. Okay, let's take a look then at this with a capacitor attached to it. So I'm gonna put it back onto its original setting so we can see all this noise. Ready? Okay, and here it is with the capacitor. Our initial peak looks like it's bigger, but then our noise is really, really tiny. So I need to Rescale this probably to 100 milliamps. Well, that's our 50 milliamps. I think let's give that a go. Yeah, we're still off. So we're peaking out at 700 milliamps now. So our spike at the startup has increased enormously. And that's, of course, because we're starting the motor from a stall and also we're having to charge a capacitor. So we expect our current to be high. And uh, if I go back to our 20 milliamp setting, just run a new trace so we can see it clearly, then we can see that uh, our noise is much, much better controlled. That's a good one. Let's put the bad one on. So here's our bad capacitor right out of the controller. And this has actually improved a little bit because I've been doing, running this test a few times. But anyway, here we go. Whoa, look at that. It's right off the scale. The current is just maxed out. Let's. Uh, Turn this down a bit and hope we can get it into into range okay so here we go we've maxed out here we are 50 milliamps per division so this is 150 milliamps constant 
that's what our bad capacitor actually looks like when it's faced with actually doing a real job. So it's got ripple on there, it's acting as a capacitor still, but it's got this huge amount of DC transfer going on. What is the controller actually doing? Well, let me put a good one back in again just for a second while we examine how it works. So here it is, I've just scaled this so I can get it on the screen. So we've got 720 milliamps peak at the start, which is just our startup current, charging the capacitor, starting the motor. Our voltage stays stable at uh, 7.4 volts. There's a bit of voltage drop, but nothing too much. And down here, here's our current, and that's gonna be running at whatever it's running at, 42 milliamps, it says here as its average. That's what we were expecting to see while we're running. When we reach the end of travel, however, what we expect to see is a stalled condition from the motor and it should peak up and the current should increase. Let's see if I can simulate that using a pair of pliers. I'm going to run this and hopefully stop it in a sensible time frame. Beautiful. I could have practiced that a hundred times. So here's our peak just as it was before. There's our motor running just as it was before. And then when we stall, all of a sudden, the current leaps up to uh, we were 100 milliamps, 300 milliamps. So that's quite a big, noticeable current. So of course, the microcontroller can ignore perhaps the first 100 milliseconds. And then it looks to see what sort of current it's delivering. And when it peaks, it knows it's reached the end of its travel. And it then knows, of course, which end of the valve it's at, whether the valve is open or closed. When we then want to operate it again, it will run it in the opposite direction. We get the same. What happens though if it's permanently frozen? Well, of course, you can probably guess. Let's just single shot that. We'll just run it. So there we go. That just sees the motor drawing a lot of current. So it's stalled, or it could be short circuited. That would do a similar sort of thing. Essentially, the current will come in and just stay high. So the next thing, of course, is what happens if our motor is open circuit, it's burnt out. There we go. So now we see our voltage go up nice and cleanly. We show our little peak as the capacitor charges, 724 milliamps apparently. And then the current just drops to the bottom and stays there. Nothing you can do will make that current go up now, apart from changing its direction, and it'll just recharge the capacitor and come back down. That way, we can detect error F05, which is an open circuit, F06, which is a short circuit, but it could be a motor stall, or it could be a short circuit on the cables, or it could be a short circuit on the capacitor. We don't know where the short circuit is, just there is a short circuit, too much current is flowing somewhere. And similarly, with an open circuit, we don't know where that is. And uh, those are our error conditions. Now, one thing I did want to show you was a bodge. In my previous video, I started doing um, a bodge with a couple of capacitors like these. These are polarized capacitors. So because this motor is reversing, sometimes it's connected positive to one side, negative to the other, and then it's the other way around. You should use a non-polarized or bipolar capacitor. But most people don't stop them, and I certainly don't. And I did want my house to be warm though. So I decided that I would do a bodge. And I started off by looking at one of these capacitors and making sure that it could only charge when it was connected the right way around. So essentially putting a diode on it to make sure it would only charge one way. That's sort of all right in terms of charging it, but the problem is it won't discharge. There's no route for the current to get back out or the voltage to discharge through that diode. Now, unfortunately, I didn't film it all because the next step is actually to put a transistor on there. When the voltage rail on the motor drops down, the transistor uses the voltage on here and becomes conductive and conducts the voltage out through the motor and to ground, essentially. So it charges, discharges. However, most people don't do that. The way that's very common is you take a pair of capacitors and we're going to put them in series. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to connect the negative to the negative and it's going to float. So this is the motor running without. So there it is. Um, I've, I've made it so we can see the noise very clearly. And then I'm going to attach one of these. I'm going to attach its positive to the positive of the motor supply as it stands at the moment. So the positive to one end of the motor, the negative floating, and this one I'm going to get the positive to the other end of the motor. Okay. So I've got the two negatives joined together. I've got one positive connected to one end of the motor, one positive connected to the other end of the motor. Let's run it and see how it behaves. 
Note these are 1000 microfarad capacitors because they're now in series, so the capacitance halves. And there we go. It's just like a good capacitor connected up again. Works absolutely perfectly. Now, truthfully, I don't think we should be doing this type of thing too much. In this case, I think it's okay. We've got an equal voltage going one way, then an equal voltage going the other way, and everything is in balance, so to speak. So I'm not too worried about that floating voltage in the middle. But uh, in some cases, yeah, I think bipolar capacitors like these, they don't really cost a lot. They're just not something you often have kicking around. So yeah, pop those in for a couple of days and then get the proper one and put it in, in its place, I think is the proper thing to do. So anyway, hopefully those experiments were interesting and slightly illuminating. So the central heating one's working down here. And there's our hot water one working. Well, my boiler is now running, my toes are defrosting, so I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, please remember to subscribe, like, share with others, and leave some comments. Bye for now, stay warm.